This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetessy. I'm Bridget Fetessy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. Our sponsor this week is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash walkin where our listeners get two free months of premium membership. That's two months free at Skillshare dot com slash walk in this week we welcome back the amazing chloe valdery she's the founder of the theory of enchantment an innovative social emotional learning course that teaches character development resiliency and love you can visit her writings in the new york times atlantic magazine the wall street journal and usa today chloe and i always just flow like old friends from the first time we ever talked and it was really great to catch up with her because she hadn't started Theory of Enchantment when we first spoke in New York. Unfortunately, we recorded this before the letter was dropped and signed online, which Chloe is a signee of. For those of you who know what that means, you know. For those of you who don't, stick around for the check-in where I'll probably be explaining it to Maggie because she's looking at me like I'm crazy. So tell me about New York in this Crazy, crazy summer. Yeah, it's wild. First of all, I love summers in New York. And uh, despite the global pandemic and crazy social unrest and uh, also cool, interesting opportunities for societal change, despite all of that, I'm, I'm, I'm really having a blast, I think. so. <laughs> is it open? Is it open up? It's slowly but surely opening up. So, like, we went through phase one, and I think phase two is starting next week. Okay. Are you working? Yeah, definitely. Like, Tell every, about, every when day. When was the last time we talked? It was, like... Years ago. <laughs> yeah, it feels that way. It's been a long time since we've done this. So a lot, I don't even think you had Theory of Enchantment, like, up and running. I didn't. Ate. I didn't. I totally didn't, because... When you had me on your podcast, remember I was asking you about how to do a podcast? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was you were one of the f very early podcasts that I did, and I believe it was, uh, yeah, it was early. And so I want you to, so are you, are you working primarily on Theory of Enchantment? Is that how you're paying the bills? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm like fully... Like on the, yeah, on the growth, on a growth, uh, I guess you could say trend, which is exciting and intimidating at the same time. So, <laughs> yeah, but tell us about theory of enchantment, where it came from, what it was born out of, what your challenges have been, all of it. Just tell us the story, the, the origin story of theory of enchantment. Sure. So yeah, I uh, moved to New York about five years ago. And I, the reason why I moved here is because I got a job at the Wall Street Journal. So I worked at the Wall Street Journal for a year with Brett Stevens, who was my mentor. Um, while there, I worked on a thesis paper. The thesis paper was essentially on the topic of how to create a framework that teach, will teach people how to love one another. Um, the reason for that is my background is in, is in international diplomacy, conflict resolution. Um, I did a lot of talks uh, in college and, and uh, post-college as well as related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, and is related to Israeli culture in general. And I was interested in trying to crack the code of how to get people to love one another despite some of the really difficult conversations they had to have um, and challenges that they had to face in their interactions with each other. And in the world of international conflict or international diplomacy, there's always this language of like, how do you get people to combat conflict? But there's never this language of how do you get people to start loving? And so I really wanted to to fill that gap and fill that need. So I did a research paper trying to study that. Um, and then I began to ask myself the question, well, what are, what are people already in love with? And can I use that as a conduit to like figure out how to build a framework to teach people how to love? Um, and for me, the, the answer to that question was pop culture. Because mm. pop culture shows us like what we're in love with as a culture. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. society. So I started to study like companies like Nike and Disney and 
singer songwriters like Beyonce, who are also brands, to figure out like what is it about these brands that we like have near religious like devotion to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Have you ever uh, seen that video? Um, and it's a, I think it's, I believe it's a TED Talk, and he he talks about how it's not about it's about the why. Oh, it's, Simon Sinek. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I love that video. I, yeah. I think that that's uh, just about how you can take a computer and it's just a computer. So why do we why do we love Apple products? Right. Exactly. What are they selling us really? Exactly. And I say that all the time about Nike. Like Nike is not selling you a tennis shoe. It's selling you the idea that you can just do it, which mm-hmm. is why you buy the tennis shoe. And, you know, it could be that like. Nike tennis shoe is the same as a, you know, Skechers tennis shoe materially, but you're not buying the material. You're not merely buying the material, uh, you know, piece you're buying into the existential piece, you're buying into the spirit of the product, not just the material product itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I discovered that the common denominator across all of these influencers were that they were creating content where their audience saw themselves and their potential reflected in the content which is why we bought it. And it was a very simple, like simple yet like really exciting discovery because basically that what that means is all these, a lot of these companies are just selling uh, like a smaller version or a reduced version of the hero's journey to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we like instinctively and fundamentally believe in the hero's journey. It's a part of our culture. It's part of many different cultures um, across the known world. And so that's why we gravitate to, Nike and Beyonce, you know, when Beyonce says to run the world, girls, many women see themselves reflected in that content and their potential reflected in that content. So, mm-hmm. so I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting <laughs> observation. Um, and I, at the time, was reading a book called Enchantment by Guy Kawasaki, who was a former marketing director of Apple. And he described enchantment as the process by which you delight someone with an idea or a product or even a personality and i was like that really i really like that word because enchantment is like very much close to what i think of when i think of the word love when i think of the word uh affinity or the idea of cultivating affinity for someone um you're you're filled with a sense of delight when you engage with a person um so i i really hooked on to that word and and decided to call what i was doing the theory of enchantment and um, came up with three principles to build this framework of love. The principles are treat people like human beings, not political abstractions, criticize to uplift and empower, never to tear down, never to destroy, root everything you do in love and compassion. And so then I I lectured on that in universities uh, here in America and in Europe for about two years. And eventually people kept telling me, you know, this isn't just relevant when it comes to international studies and diplomacy it's relevant to all kinds of conflict interpersonal conflicts re- relevant to social emotional learning um, in high schools for example mm-hmm. so you so you might want to consider seriously like running with this and, yeah uh, and expanding upon it so eventually enough people told me that and i decided to listen and i ended up creating a 25 lesson course um which is the official theory of enchantment course that uses pop culture and really incredibly rich texts from some of the moral, philosophical, and intellectual giants of our time, from you know James Baldwin to Dr. Maya Angelou to to you know um, Ralph Ellison, but also in- includes folks like uh, Jay Z, Kendrick Lamar, John Mayer, Cheryl Strayed. So really uh, blending pop culture with with sort of ancient wisdom to reveal to the consumer, to the student, as it were, that ancient wisdom could still be revealed in contemporary texts. And that's what makes ancient wisdom timeless. That's why we say that ancient wisdom is timeless because it can, it will reveal itself regardless of the time that you're living in. Um, So that's what I do. I've, I've basically been selling this course to individuals and to teachers and to uh, companies looking for professional development, either from a general professional development training or from a, you're from a DER anti-racism uh, perspective um, because my course, because it has, it, it engages students and it forces students to really study the writings and texts of a lot of prominent African Americans throughout history. It's DEI and it's um, diversity and inclusion in a, in a, in a serious uh, and an integrated way. So that's, mm-hmm. that's what the Urban Chairman is. 
That's amazing. So how, what have the ups and downs been? How's it been going? When did you launch it officially? So I launched it a year and a half ago. Um, and, you know, sort of like uh, I, I was the majority of the funds came from lecturing still because I was still lecturing on college campuses um, about this. Uh, so the, the majority of the of the income came from that. And that was sort of like seasonal. So it it flow it ebbed and flowed with like the school season, obviously. So like when college was in set was in uh, when people were in school and people wanted to invite speakers to come speak. That was when the business was really was really booming. Whereas in the summer, it wouldn't necessarily be booming as much. So it, was, it correlated with the school season. But what's crazy about the time that we're living in now is that now, because of everything that's happened, the image heaven is just blowing up. Mm, yeah, <laughs> like way way more consistent growth than than pre COVID. So it's been fascinating to watch. I I would imagine that it is blowing up though, and in, in this time. Because I think it's so necessary as an antidote to what is essentially a, a very kind of deconstructive uh, ideology that seems to permeate uh, everything right now. Mm-hmm. So I feel like there's uh, there's just a, a need for something that's more aspirational. My biggest gripe with all of the kind of critical theory stuff that goes around is that it just doesn't seem aspirational. It seems yeah. like there's so much it wants to deconstruct everything until there's nothing. Yeah. It's um, so, it's really unfortunate. It sort of takes certain aspects of Christian dialectics. Um, but it only takes like the I and this is ironic because it like claims that it's deconstructing everything, but it's actually still very much firmly rooted in um, certain aspects of our history, specifically the more puritanical impulses of our society. Mm-hmm. Um, so even as it strives to sort of escape, it, it, like get into an escape velocity and escape the civilization that birthed it, it's very much a product of Western civilization. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it is. I've just been reading so much from all these different periods of time. And I still even just even just w- speaking of like pop culture, I just was binge watching Medici and I'm like, God, women okay. have never had it so good. <laughs> you know, not all women everywhere, <laughs> but yeah. in general, we were property and just bargaining tools for yeah. like until one or two minutes ago in the history <laughs> of of us. Yeah. And it's just so crazy to me. And there's obviously always progress. But man, I I think of how many opportunities I have as a woman now and how I can say, no, I don't want to sleep with you and things like that. And it's completely, you know, not only acceptable, but it's what it's it's like normal. Mm -hmm. And that was not normal. (laughs) That was not even acceptable. Yeah. It's crazy because, like, um, one of the things I've noticed about not not all of my generation, but some of my generation, and this is certainly the case for Gen Z, like, we're not tethered to the past at all. Yeah, we're, like, yeah. very present and atomized to our peril. Like, it's not, it's not a good it's really It's really not a good thing to have zero reverence for the past. Yeah. Um, because then that causes like vanity and arrogance and like an, uh, an inability and unwillingness to learn from the mistakes of the past and, and a lack of, uh, I guess, a way to, 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 to measure progress, right? If, right. You don't even, if you don't even study the past, how can you measure progress? And that goes back to my whole point about the fact that these people who engage in a lot of critical race theory are ironically, while they're like protesting Western civilization, are very much the products of Western civilization and they're puritanical right like hyper puritanical fetishes. It's like really astounding to watch, not just like the obvious, the obvious degradation that comes from it, but just the ignorance is just like, so gross. (laughs) What? Yeah. It's I, I think I saw you saying something about that ridiculous tweet that was going around. Somebody said something about how we should be building statues for Stalin. And I'm like, I can't even, (laughs) I can't even take you seriously. You're not a serious person. How do yeah. I take you seriously when you say something like this? But yeah, this is so this weird. is a pretty common 
you know, the, you see things that you would think somebody said to me recently, we're going to look back on this and wonder why we listen to so many insane people. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> and I hope that's right. <laughs> how, why do you think yeah, I mean, I'm like, it, I always say like history, you know, when people are like, Oh, history will judge us. I'm like, it's pretty, it's pretty optimistic to think that anyone in the future will be doing any judging of this for, from my perspective sometimes. Why do you think that like Gen Z in particular has become unyoked from the current of, you know, humankind up until this point? Is it technology or is it, is this every generation and we just yeah. didn't notice it? That's an interesting question. I think there are a bunch of theories that, that float around. I think there is something to the idea that like every generation as we, you know, quote unquote, move forward into the future, which is such a, a kind of an odd thing to say since like because of the nature of time. But anyway, every generation is obviously separated from the past um, in some way. And every generation is less likely to to maybe engage in the education required to actually learn from the past. Um, so th- I'm sure there's a little bit of that to it. I think with Gen Z, it also has to do with, you know, the fact that Gen Z has been extremely coddled. And obviously, uh, folks like Jonathan Haidt have spoken about this. Um, but they've been overprotected at, by their parents, um, and th- which is not good because... One of the things that I've realized in the past few months, thinking about everything that's happening and seeing how people have been responding to it. And to be sure, it's not just Gen Z. I feel like people don't understand that life is suffering. Right. Like, like if, if we solve the problem of racism tomorrow, life would still be suffering. Right. And that's a, that's a, that's again, that's a piece of ancient wisdom, right? That people are like not privy necessarily to understanding. And it doesn't mean that's not an excuse to not try to advance progress and to advance justice. Um, but even as we advance toward justice, we also have to keep in mind that life is suffering. Those two, right. those two things are not like contradictory things. And so the question is like, how do you develop the fortitude, the agency to, and the, and the wisdom to understand that the way that you deal with suffering is by attempting to transcend it. Right. right? And to become and, and and you try and if you transcend it, then that means you are worthy of it. Um, and to be able to see that suffering is a gift, um, not only not only a form of hardship, and it is a form of hardship, but it is also a gift that teaches us how to overcome and teaches us resilience. It teaches us grit. Um, and without that, we're just like again constantly in the present in a very uh, emotionally immature way, completely untethered to the past, uh, completely untethered to community, completely like atomized, um, and with no, with no real like relationship to reality, which is crazy because people have been promoting the works of James Baldwin lately. Um, and I teach James Baldwin in theory of enchantment and Mm -hmm. like Baldwin pointed this out in the fire next time, uh, when he talked about how white Americans, this is in the late sixties lacked sensuality. And he defines sensuality as just like a basic relationship with a basically healthy relationship with life. Like just to be able to bask in the joys of life itself. Like, and, and, you know, Ralph Ellison talked about this in shadow and act of like the capacity of the incredible spirit of the African American tradition is, or, or lies in part in the fact that African American culture was so strong that it that its members of it were able to like construct for the for themselves a very rich life despite yeah. the hardships and despite the turmoils that we encountered. And then when I look at when I when I think of someone like Ibram Kendi, whose work is being uh, promoted right now, who 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 wrote in um, his his famous book How to Be an Anti Racist, he wrote that, and I'm paraphrasing, he wrote that life itself was a form of white privilege. Um, and I don't think, I don't think, I don't know about, I don't know him. Obviously I have no idea. Like, I I just have no idea. But like when other people read that, like, I wonder if he understands the extent which that is such an insult (laughs) to black black Americans. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean this, I had coach T on and he does, uh, he's amazing. He works with 
guys who are kind of he tr- helps like reform guys who are in and out of the prison system and then he also does all of the music for roast battle at the comedy store and he is a genius with that like the guy is a genius i don't even know how he gets the clips up so quickly he was hilarious on the podcast recently and he was talking about how he finds the whole idea of um white privilege insulting and he is because he's like, that just assumes that somehow I want to be white. And he's like, I don't want to be white. You're cheesy. He was like, I don't want to be a white guy. He's like, they're cheesy. They can't dance. Their culture is corny. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's it's something that I don't feel like we hear enough of that. We yeah. don't hear, you know, he's he was like, I just think it assumes that people want to people want to be. Um, he says he just gets offended by the idea that. <laughs> that somehow it would be something that he would want to trade. Yeah, there is a kind of contradictory, I guess, framework happening in some critical race theorists' ideas where they go, where they talk about white privilege, but then they also talk about how, well, maybe they don't talk about this as much, but I think some of them do about how vapid aspects of, uh, of I guess, you know, waspy culture is which doesn't really that's not really internally consistent there's also the fact that it's like it's not that i don't believe in the concept of white privilege it's that it's a little bit missing the point because at all times there are an infinite set of privileges counteracting each other (laughs) yeah right and so and so why such a magnifying glass has been put upon this one in particular, it begs the question. There's no necessary proof that, that that putting a magnifying glass on this particular kind of privilege leads to the kind of outcomes, the just outcomes um, that we would want in terms of like better schools, better healthcare, better you know investment in terms of like material investment in the black community. I'm not sure that like highlighting white privilege, though it does exist, actually leads to that. Right. Um, nor does it account for just the fact that, again, there's an, always an infinite amount of privileges that people from all walks of life carry and are constantly counteract. So, like, I might meet a white person and by virtue of being white, they might have a privilege in this context, in a, con- in a certain context. But in another context, I'm, it may be the case that I grew up because I grew up in a two parent family and that white person grew up in a one parent family. I might actually have a privilege uh, of some sort because I grew up in that uh, environment compared to how this white person grew up. So like, I t- yeah. You know, I took the Buzzfeed quiz, like how privileged are you just cause it was funny. Yeah. And <laughs> I, <laughs> I was like, can I print this out and be like, see, I'm not privileged. And because of my upbringing and moving a lot and I didn't finish college, I, and like there, I grew up in a divorced family. I, I had a lot of things that and it was like, you are underprivileged. <laughs> like, you know, there's a lot that's of such a ugh, that makes me so I'm not even angry. I'm just like I'm displeased at the lack of like aesthetically, that's just a horrible idea. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, as you know, I love art. And that's just like, yeah. ugh, you guys you guys aren't are coming up with the worst ideas content wise. Yeah, I mean, I I agree, but it was a hilarious exercise, and <laughs> well, because I've been in treatment, I've had a drug addiction. Yeah. There's all kinds of things that um, lowered my privilege, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> which some of them were choices I made, you know. So, yeah, like some of them were things that I chose and didn't have any control over, and some of them were, and then it judged. That was the strange thing about the quiz is that it would it judged immutable characteristics with choices that I made on an equal playing field, which I thought was so strange. Too. How does that work though? I don't know. It just would say like, <laughs> are, are you a person of color? No. Okay. So then I, I, I don't even know how it really scores it. It's yeah. basically like <laughs> yes or no questions. And if you answer no to a certain number if you answer yes to a certain number, it determines on how underprivileged you are. <laughs> yeah, that's so. What is that? It's like astrology, but for or like, overprivileged you are. <laughs> for like woke astrology for woke people, it's so weird. <laughs> I was like, can I print this and have it be like my certificate of my privilege, my privilege? <laughs> 
My privilege. My privilege. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because I I've had I being in the space that we both kind of occupy, which is the vast wasteland of the center, ish. Um, people on the right don't believe. A lot of people on the right will be like, "White privilege is bullshit." Yeah, the, so, a lot of a lot of people on the right also suffer from puritanical. How impulses. do you <laughs> how do you define it or explain it to somebody who thinks that it's not real? So I mean, I I, I would talk about like racism. <laughs> like I was just talking about like examples of actual systemic racism, and systemic racism doesn't have to be in every system for it to be systemic, right? That's where the that's where certain elements of the left, I think. Um, need to pull it back. But like, for example, in, you know, after Ferguson, what happened with Michael Brown um, in 2014, like, like there were conservatives who were like, you see the courts prove that Michael Brown was obviously wrestling with the guy's gun. And so the officer was justified. But like my retort to that is that yes, but the department of justice also found that the particular police department in question was like systemically racist. Like they were sending emails um, you know, to each other that were hor- like the- that depicted black people in-, in really horrible ways that were like very, there was a very clear culture of racism in that mm-hmm. department, in that uh, police department. And of course that it informed and affected, um, you know, what eventually culminated um, in, the f- in-, in Ferguson and the subsequent Ferguson protests. So like, I-, I would say that some people on the right have this have this uh, impulse to like cherry pick whatever facts suit them. I mean, people on the right and the left do this um, equally. Right. Um, but the right also tends to like, they do this and I, I'm generalizing about everyone disclaimer. Um, but <laughs> there are That's folks fine. on the right who also do this bait and switch thing. Like and Candace Owens does this, right. Where she like waxes passionately about the flaws of George Floyd, which she did in a video. Um, recently I, yeah i saw it but yeah unfortunately i did too. but anyway but in the, but in 54 the, million of us side <laughs> um but in the same but in the same like what in the same vein she'll be like on a phone on a tv show with dennis prager like without with no hints of irony talking about how amazing the west has always been and there's a clip on youtube in particular where she's like why are you angry at Christopher Columbus Day? Like these people, these people invented, you know, monotheism, which first of all isn't true. But like, basically, what she does is she has this uncanny and eerie thing where she elevates, she emphasizes the flaws of Black Americans, but when it comes to like the the Western white progenitors of the American ideal, she can't see any of their flaws. Like, oh, right. this is just. Oh, like Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. Oh, yeah, that brutal, horrible, flaw, evil is something that I'm just going to overlook and just like I'm just going to champion Thomas Jefferson. But it's like, so the so the left tends to believe that America is all evil, and the right tends to believe that America is all good. And the truth is that we're both. And so, like, my job is to be able to, like, hopefully come and come in and and try to highlight this and try to engage people in nuance and complexity because. What people are doing when they reject and, and they refuse to acknowledge this nuance and complexity, they're actually rejecting their own nuance and complexity. When they when they stereotype others, they're also stereotyping themselves. And so it's a very dangerous cycle. So Yeah. I think that what I see, like you said on the right, they'll cherry kind they'll cherry pick facts and they do this on the left, although I would say the left disregards facts almost entirely. <laughs> entirely. <laughs> like, sure, they just yeah. don't really want to deal with them at all and focus actually more on feelings and how that is is kind of the more important truth and in, in quotes, I would say. And yeah. on the right, they'll ignore feelings almost entirely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And which is also just, a problem. <laughs> well, because just because you want something, you know, they'll be like, show me examples of systemic racism. And just because you can't show specific policies, then they're like, yeah. oh, well, see, it's not, it doesn't exist. <laughs> that's an example. You're like, that's not the way it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting because I think both uh, the right and the left suffer from metaphysical things. Like the left 
like I, I, I believe in art. I'm an artist. I think art is everything. So I'm someone who champions emotion and properly channeled emotion. And certainly I, I don't believe in this notion that like human beings are ra- rational beings. Actually, you know, another thing that Jonathan Haidt showed in the happiness hypothesis was that the brain is, is uh, wired as such that the, that the rationality is actually a slave to emotion, not the other way around. Yeah. Um, which is why every time Ben Shapiro says facts don't care about your feelings, I'm like, actually, actually, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know I feel the same way. I'm like, but feelings are literally they're based in chemical reactions your yeah. body is having. They yeah. they are factual. Yeah, <laughs> they are rooted in our <laughs> facts are rooted in our feelings. Yeah. Um, but I but I digress. But the pro- I think the problem with the left is like they tend to. So this actually goes back to certain observations about wasp culture, which which mm-hmm. some aspects of it tend to be like rather sterile and empty from a spiritual perspective, like hyper materialistic, hyper hyper consumerist. And what that does is at least a desiccation of the spirit. And I think what you're seeing is a, a is a kind of overcompensation and really a craving for that spiritual maturity and, and and for something that is spiritual spiritually nourishment nourishing which uh, which hasn't actually um been present in a lot of the communities that we're talking about that end up uh like sort of falling prey to certain uh certain i guess you could call it problematic leftist tendencies yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very diplomatic way of putting it chloe <laughs> somewhat, somewhat uh fascist uh but that makes sense because like again pure if you're puritanical right pur- puritanical and fascist are kind of synonyms or can't or yeah. can be synonyms um but on the right i think that there's the unnecessary fear of emotion and almost this uh almost like an autistic it is literally autistic to, like, <laughs> emotion. And I don't, I don't, I mean, zero disrespect to, you know, those in the autistic community when I say it, when I say that, but like, there's like a weird, again, there's a lack of sensuality. Um, there's like, there's like feigned sensuality on the left and a total lack of sensuality on the right. Right. Anyways. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating um, I still feel like in my core, I'm optimistic. Although my friend Ava called me yesterday and she was saying, she's like, you know, we worked on the f- weed farms together. <laughs> she's like, you know, <laughs> she's like, we used to talk about how humanity was headed for this moment. And considering that we knew this, I feel oddly ill prepared. <laughs> I, like, I was like, we you know, should have thought like, that I was. She's like, you know, <laughs> even though we saw all of this coming, <laughs> how is it that? I'm not ready for it. Yeah. yeah. And it's true because we were living up there. We're like, we need to get a house. We need to grow our food. We need to secure water. And then I'm like, look, I don't have enough money for this. So I need to go <laughs> engage in capitalist, you know, the, the, the way I don't have enough money to prepare for the apocalypse. And we were yeah. joking about how the apocalypse is coming faster than we could afford to get ready for it. I'm like, yeah. I need to do a stand up routine about this. Yeah. Like, I, I was not. I knew it was coming, but I didn't have enough money. And I've always given people who have money shit. I'm like, how do you not have water? How do you not have a bunker somewhere? How do you not have three oh, generators? Yeah. Like, how are you not actually preparing? For, yeah, you have money. For the thing to hit the fan. It's crazy because, like, I feel like, in retrospect, like, I, I feel like this was a curveball. And this entire time, I was just preparing my bat. And I didn't even know it. Like, with Theory of Enchantment specifically, like, as soon as... As soon as COVID-19 hit, I was like, okay, time to start meditating for an hour every single day because I know that stuff is about to hit the fan and I got to prepare my nervous system, calm down yeah. the nervous system, you know, and, and, and ready myself. And really it's uh, unfortunate that it required a crisis, but like it seems apparently that people respond to theory of enchantment in times of crisis. So, so yeah, I'm just uh, trying to ride the wave really. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. The online learning community is offering our listeners two months of free premium membership. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity with classes from Skillshare. Right now, 
Skillshare is such a great resource to have so you can stay inspired, express yourself, and connect to a community of creatives with fascinating classes on topics like drawing, writing, and journaling, also graphic design, illustration, photography, animation, fine art, film and video, marketing, productivity, freelance and entrepreneurship, and so much more. This week, I'm taking the course Finding Success Online, Grow Your Social Following into a Creative Business. This should be an interesting course considering that I've pretty much stumbled my way into my success online and have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. So it might be good for me to take a course and see if there are any tips or tricks I can learn. I do like the lesson in the power of the personal brand. I think that might be helpful for me. Creating successful content. That would be useful considering how much content I'm creating. Growing my business. I should probably just skip ahead to lesson seven right away. I like these courses. They make me think I can do things that I have no idea how to do, like draw. Skillshare gives me wings. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life and all the circumstances that come with it. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash walk in where our listeners get two free months of premium membership. That's two months free at Skillshare.com slash walk in. I feel like I'm in the same, a similar boat and that <laughs> the fantasy community is growing and growing and growing because I, people are hungry for nuance and some yeah. they're getting hungrier for it. Yeah. And ways, if you're somewhat reasonable at all, I think you are craving balance. Yeah. I think most humans are, but if I was all in on either one of these, what either, either ideology Life would be much easier and I'd probably be a lot, you know, I'd have that money for the apocalypse, but <laughs> I don't I would, know that. I don't know that that's true though. Like as I a would hate myself. Positive. Yeah. Like I would like, I, not I, worth I, it. I see some of these folks, like some of these commentators and I'm like, you again, it's like, you don't have a touchstone for reality. You're not in touch with reality. You're like parroting things that other people told you. You ha you don't have the courage to think for yourself and you don't even have the courage to risk being wrong. Um, right. like it's, it's, and so, the, and so therefore you're sterile and you're stale and you're like, you're like internally empty and it's like, ugh, you know, I, I, <laughs> I had a friend a long time ago who said, I like mirrors too much. You know, he, he kind of became an <laughs> apostate from the right. Yeah. And he's like, I would have gone down that road. And I saw that moment and I just like mirrors too much to, <laughs> to have sold out. I want to be able to look myself in the eye. Yeah. Yeah. That, oh my God. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. But I don't, I think actually that, that there's no internal, I don't think that they have, I don't think people who went all in and even if they may appear as disingenuous to us, I feel like they have, they sleep like babies. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't, don't, I I'm don't not a mind that. reader, but it seems like they're pretty living, pretty comfortable lives. <laughs> yeah. But this is one of, this is one of my challenges to like Ibram Kindi who defines white supremacy not in terms of a moral ethic like it's if you read how to be an anti-racist it's internally inconsistent like sometimes he talks about a moral ethic and then he like he like sort of has whiplash and then starts talking about like material wealth and power and so <laughs> and so it's like like are you are you against white supremacy because it's evil or are you against white supremacy because your argument is that too many whites have wealth and power? Cause that's but a totally that, different argument. I, <laughs> but I feel like that's just saying the quiet part out loud. Yes. It's, it's, it's like you want power and money yeah. and resources. And, and okay. If that's, if that's what this is about, <laughs> then like stop posture right. like, as a virtuous person and say that. But, but my point is that like, I'm hesitant to assume that people with material wealth and power are happy. In fact, I think that what we are witnessing is the outcome of the fact that many people with wealth and power have not been happy all this time and are like, and, and need like spiritual sustenance and are, and are trying to get it in very problematic ways. <laughs> like um, making videos? <laughs> no, just like by like, 
by like, like making celebrity claiming, videos in black and white. Yeah, by like <laughs> claiming to be anti-fascist, by like talking right. about how we should praise Stalin. Like you just don't know what you're talking about, you know. And so it's, yeah, it's you, it's very sad in many ways to watch. Like, I I actually feel sorry for a lot of these people. I I mean maybe they sleep happy, but like if so, that's even worse. That's like ugh, you really don't. You're really blind. You're really oblivious to to history to to your own life. Um, and to your own sort of life's worth, I think. And that's really sad, ultimately. It seems, and Coach T was talking a lot about this. He was, he was, his whole thing is he's like, it's all envy. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> <laughs> he said yeah. it's just, like, he basically sees all of it as a, a lack of spirituality. And he's very um, grounded in scripture. And he mm-hmm. just kept kind of referring back to it. But he's like, this is all envy. And, and you know, he was so funny. Just his perspective was it's funny when you kind of I love a how everyone thinks Robin D'Angelo is black and B <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. what a grift that is because yeah. ultimately she's teaching white people how to be racist. It's such a yeah. weird inside out thing. And I'm like, how did this woman get to like, I mean, she had sixteen thousand dollars to go te- talk at schools or whatever. Yeah. What a, I mean, what a grift. Yeah. What a grift. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because it's like on on some level I'm like really I'm actually not upset because there's very little that I get like physically or no. emotionally outraged about these days. Yeah, I think it has yeah, something right. to do with the meditation. Um, but <laughs> but part of me is like, oh, but it's cool because it's like thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? So like, Robin D'Angelo. Uh, nothing against her personally but represents a, a, an ideology that like theory of enchantment is a hundred percent um predisposed against <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's like it's like something it's something to be nobly against um which i think is a good thing so from just from a utilitarian perspective that's great but yeah i mean it's this it's this weird uh i said the other day that I thought Kendi, and I think this is true for D'Angelo as well. Like people think that they're getting Jesus from these people when they're really getting like the high sparrow from Game of Thrones. <laughs> if, if folks are familiar with that reference. It's like, yeah. no, no. <laughs> no, guys. That is going back to kind of theory of enchantment and what it is grounded in. People are searching. And I, I've been talking to so many people in my inboxes like, a confession booth from all sides of people just saying, I feel like I'm going insane and I keep hearing this and I too meditate every day. And I've yeah. been very much like I have to work out. I've got to get strong. I need to, I feel like I need my mind and my body to be strong more over and over. That's just the message I keep getting and hearing. And I am nothing to the world if I'm not spiritually fit in particular and base. And I've been joking that I'm, I feel like that little dog in the burning house just also coming from my upbringing, the, Mm -hmm. the chaos. I'm like, this is fine. I actually, (laughs) I actually feel like I can really thrive in this kind of chaos. It's when my life is chaotic and the world is normal that I feel out of sync. But yeah, that's that's actually an interesting psychological insight. It's like (laughs) folks, folks who are, this goes back to my whole point about suffering, right? Like folks who have experience overcoming suffering, and dealing with chaos, whether of a, of a material nature or of a psychological nature or both, um, folks who have experience with that are actually probably more likely to be able to navigate what's going on now than folks who have been coddled all their lives or overprotected all their lives and, and, and have not really been made aware of the fact that life is suffering, life is chaos, and chaos is always on the brink. It's always, it's, it's always uh, just outside the door, at least the potential for chaos. Um, so I knew that people were going to basically start to have breakdowns because it's hard to it's when you're first made aware of it. It's a cognitive dissonance that ensues because what you thought the world was is not actually what the world is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really messes people up. And so but again, if you've been conditioned by chaos and if you've been conditioned to be able to overcome suffering, then when suffering comes once more, you will be able to withstand it. 
And I just, I keep telling people it can always get worse. They'll be like, oh, now we're on quarantine. I'm like, yeah, just be glad. My aunt's like, and now we have curfew. I'm like, I've been telling you not to stop saying like, (laughs) it can't get any worse because it can. We still have the internet. We still have running water. Like in my brain, I'm, I'm preparing for the moments when those things aren't around because most of, again, going back to just what the human experience has been for so much of our time, the majority yeah. of people were trying to figure out how to get bread for yeah. and food for a day. And I think just talking to Jacob, my friend who's a Holocaust survivor, and he lives mm-hmm. very close to me, so now we speak regularly. And he's like, we will persist. We always do. We have to. And, you know, he's like, I have to remain optimistic because that is that's what saved me. But he also has is deeply uh, in touch with the nature of man. So he's fundamentally <laughs> yeah. not surprised at all about anything that's happening, but he is disappointed because, yeah. you know, the, the struggle, I think that people, we just have a lot. We don't struggle for food that yeah. I was reading, um, the glass castle because so many people were telling me, and my sisters are like, God, oh, it's just like, we had a kind of crazy upbringing. I'm like, yeah, but even still as much as I can identify with that, I wasn't taking people's leftover food out of the garbage at school because I was hungry, which Mm -hmm. I feel is when you know hunger, that is just another level of the, that basic human. Yeah. And I, and for some reason it's always been my weird, I have a lot of weird paranoia, not like paranoias, but things that I have like a weird water thing where I just have to always have water with me and I need to know Mm -hmm. that I have enough water. And I've joked many times that I think I was a starving peasant, like in every past life I've ever lived Mm -hmm. because I have a weird (laughs) food obsession, you know, like I need to, when the, when the quarantine hit, I'm like, I got to learn how to make bread. It's like, this feels very, very, like something in my DNA was activated. <laughs> well, like, you know, a lot of people started baking bread when yeah. COVID-19 happened. <laughs> plague times, man. The plague. <laughs> the plague. <laughs> the plague, like, activated. Because I was saying, I'm like, has anyone done a study on this? Was, like, why did everyone start making bread? Other than just <laughs> being at home and having time. Like, what the hell was that? I don't know. I, th- I think it was like people were bored and, and people were willing to get into things that actually required patience, That's true. Um, you know, and like some sort of m- making bread is actually, I think I've never done it, but my sense is that it's meditative on some level. It really um, is. So that probably, that probably also played a role, you know. I was thinking a lot about Chappelle's special and how yeah. he said these are the streets talking. And I've been trying to, I mean, I wrote it in my journal, but I, I feel like I, c- I could almost be a piece just about how that just resonated with me so much. Because when I was watching all the looting and the rioting, my instinct, my gut instinct was I want to hug everyone. I just wanted to hug everyone. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was like, when I was a kid and I was in a really messed up home environment and it was smoke going to school, skipping school, smoking cigarettes, doing all these things and acting out. No one stopped to say, hey, what's going on with the system that might be causing you to act out? Yeah. And I just see so much of the behavior as acting out because something isn't right with our system. Yeah, no, definitely. And I just wish that there, but instead it becomes like pointing fingers and blaming and like I saw all the kids in Santa Monica. I'm like, these are kids. They're like freaking 17 year old kids. They're kids. Yeah. They're just kids acting out and being opportunistic. I did the same exact crap. Not, I didn't do the same thing, but I acted out when I was a kid and when I had a, you know, no parents paying attention. And, and so I loved when he said that because it does feel like society is the, the youth are acting out a bit. We should, and something is, something isn't right. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I have this, I really want to like make the people dance because yeah, I love that idea. Yeah. Like people need synchronicity and people need to be reminded how truly and deeply and even like <laughs> eerily interconnected we all are mm. um, and how we're actually living the same exact reality just through different, um, through different perspectives. Um, but yeah, I, I, I I feel like, especially like as a DJ and as someone who's like, who loves music and believes in the healing power of music, like I want to get people to just start dancing with each other. 
and people I, across, you know, racial divides and political divides, etc. Everything's become so serious. I had a woman on yesterday and her story is still vibrating inside of me and she lost her son at 12. He went to bed and never woke up and perfectly oh, healthy. Wow. I mean, and she had like a that sudden spiritual shift that you kind of hear about where she basically said she woke up the next day and it was the worst nightmare you could ever imagine. And she surrendered and she was like, I did everything that I didn't think that I would do. I, I said yes to everything. I mm-hmm. engaged. She said I went to, she was a like type a woman and she went dancing and she That's did awesome. breath work and set yeah. up all kinds of things. And, she was saying her whole her whole organization that she started is all about bringing more play and playfulness oh, cool. into yeah. everything because she feels like we need it. You know, yeah. the, not only just kids, but bringing that playfulness. What's, what's the name of her organization? Um, it's oh my gosh, I have it's like <laughs> a it's it's like letters and numbers, which is why I have oh, to okay. look it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you are optimistic. I'm, you know, I. On my good days, I'm optimistic. Okay, yeah. Like, my my optimism is based on my spiritual condition. Yeah. So, on Same. the days that I'm feeling very pessimistic, which I definitely have, or m- less than pessimistic, I would say I go to, my go-to is nihilism. Mm-hmm. And on the days that I'm nihilistic, I know that I'm not doing the work I need to be doing. And usually it's something as simple as looking at what my resentments are or looking at where I'm lacking gratitude. I find that a lack of gratitude for what I have is really fundamentally part of the problem on those days when I feel nihilistic and also just kind of tripping out into the future because I'm in LA in a city and I don't know if I want to stay or go. And I feel like everyone's in this place of where do Mm -hmm. I go and what do I do? And I'm wanting my, my gut instinct is telling me to get the fuck out and go get (laughs) land and just, and has been by the way for like two years. And I've just been, not ignoring it, but just putting it off and saying, I, I'm still not sure that I'm right. I have family here. You know, I don't, I don't, there's mostly I have family here. If I didn't have family here, I don't know that I'd still be here Yeah. because now it's not like I'm here writing on a show and I don't really see any of Hollywood allowing someone as problematic as me on in their writer's room, for instance. Sure. So I can really go work from anywhere in the world at this point. And Mm -hmm. I just wrote a piece about how we need social media distancing. I, I am 100% on board with what Sam Harris was saying in his most recent podcast about, can we pull ourselves back from the brink? I don't think that it helps things. I think that the algorithm is absolutely programmed to trigger our work to, operate and trigger and inflame our worst instincts Mm -hmm. that we've spent, you know, kind a couple of hundred of years trying to use reason and the enlightenment values to over overcome some of those and art in particular. Yeah. Um, I don't know though. I, I hear that, but then I go back to like, but the power of branding I'm telling you, if you could come up with a powerful brand, and I think I'm seeing this on my Twitter, certainly, in terms of like in, an increase in following, it's like, yeah, the algorithm is definitely set up to uh, promote division, but I also simultaneously feel like because you because we know that there are people that are hungry for what we have to offer, we can we can trick the algorithm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen it. I can't. I've I've massively even just in the past couple weeks. I I think just I've seen that absolutely be true. So I think we there's still space as long as we are allowed to be nuanced. Yeah. <laughs> that will still. You know, I always say I'm like I don't care if Shadow Ban is real. I don't care if YouTube demonetizes me. I'm just happy that I uh, exist on those platforms and people can find me. Yeah. So as long as my work is still there, people can go find it. And I'm in a position with 
even just being on Dave Rubin's platform on Locals, that feels, you know, I I know that I'll always exist there. So it's nice to have a place there where I'm not too worried about getting booted off or saying something that's you're not allowed to say, which sounds ridiculous. But yeah. we, I think that's the thing that makes me the... It's weird because the Trump stuff and on the right, I... It it makes me upset, but he's like such a bumbling narcissist. It's yeah, it's just exactly. it's upsetting. But the stuff that I see on the left when I start getting emails from people about getting fired for for texting something or for the professors getting you know peep that stuff scares the crap out of me. Mm-hmm. And yeah. put, it puts me in a really that is the stuff that puts me in a really dark place where I'm like, holy shit, this is terrifying. This actually yeah. is terrifying in in a in a way that I can't always put my finger on or articulate. Yeah, because it's authoritarianism. Uh, it's creeping tyranny. It's crazy because it's like, oh, which which uh, tyrant should we choose? The narcissistic yeah. one on the right or the narcissistic ones on the left? Yeah, I mean, that's... And I've been saying this for years. I'm like, I feel it creeping on both sides. And in fact, they, they play off each other. They need each other. They the more that the left becomes tyrannical, the more it gives the right an excuse to exercise their power and so on and so forth. And so I just see this as on my dark nihilistic days of, I need to get the F out of this city and go (laughs) build a ranch in Idaho. Um, (laughs) I, I was going to ask you where you want to move specifically. I don't know. I'm looking around somewhere with water. That's my primary concern. Okay. Yeah. You know, I sometimes think about Arizona, but then I'm like, ah, eh, the water situation there isn't <laughs> great. It's very hot and hard to survive. Although it's also makes it a good kind of fortress because you have to cross deserts to like get there. It's a natural fortress in some ways, but I don't know. I just, I feel like on, I just, have to stay in my little bubble and it's it's very jordan peterson like clean your room yeah and this is very much in the 12-step program you know see to it that your own house is in order and great things will come to pass like i cannot give away anything if my own shit isn't yeah of course good so i just have to i find that when i get tripped out on the external and start future tripping or freaking out and or being in fear that i'm like just come back yeah do go clean your room go for a run go like if i get if i start getting agitated i'll i'll work out or something like that and try and control what i very 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 little i can control which is my environment immediate environment my relationships my work not even not even the results of my work just doing the work and my mood and that's yeah. Pretty much it. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. It's crazy because, like, I, I think about this contrast between, like, we we're talking about earlier how, like, a lot of people are only living in the present, but they're, and they have no connection to the past, but they're not, they're not living in the present in that they're, like, cultivating a sense of presence w- from within. They're not, mm. it's not like they're, it's not like they are, exhibiting this idea that they're at peace with their selves, themselves or that they're content with themselves, which is what you're describing, which is a kind of timelessness, right? It's a presence that's rooted in the idea of timelessness, which is still rooted in the wisdom of the ancient because ancient wisdom is timeless. In this case, it's like people who are just like so fleeting in their, it's not, a, yeah. it's not that they're present, yeah. it's that they're fickle, right? <laughs> My therapist would say it's the difference between being self-centered and centered in yourself. Ooh. Which I love. I she's love like, that. Yeah, she's, and I think that's, that's what cool. you're describing, is yeah. that you're talking about a lot of people who are very present, but they're very self-centered, and they're not centered in their self. And so we're always trying to go from, you know, if we're breaking something down, she's like, well, this is coming from a cent- self-centered place, and how do we switch that lens and and have it have you be more centered in yourself which is why i say when i'm being reactive i'm like okay i'm focused on me but i'm not focused on what i can you know even like a simple thing she had me do is wake up and say every morning what can i give 
to the world today. Just like ask ask the creator or the the universe to guide me in how I can be of service to the world yeah. instead of being waking up and being like, what can I get? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, Even if it's all not this, that direct. But all of this goes back to my problem with like this mater- this language of like materialism that has come to characterize some of the objectives that folks in the critical race theory philosophy seem to advance. It's like very uh, it's form of spiritual lack and spiritual impoverishment. But like like you said, like I I know that Oprah recommends that people write down every single day at least five things they're grateful for. And I kind of started doing that during COVID. But I re- remember today that I actually really need to practice that like every single day because it's a part it's a part of like what for me like what centers what what centers me and what reminds me to be just grateful for being alive to take in this life with all of its challenges and all of its, you know, obstacles, like just to be alive is a, is a, is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And we take it for granted. And, and these are some practices that I think can help us stop doing that. And the reason why the first one third of theory of enchantment course is all about teaching people about the self is precisely because of everything that we're describing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I think what I love about your course is that it's this thing that, is really important and that I feel like I've gotten away from just being uh, focused on the culture war, especially in the past two weeks with just also being in a place where there was so much uh, physically around me that I had to pay attention to. And it puts you in a little bit more of a heightened, obviously you're in the same place where it's like constant sirens. There's just that, uh, that agitation, but it's cultivating that sense of wonder um, yes, which yes. I feel like I've I've gotten away from. Like I I read this morning. I'm like I have to get back into reading these. They're these sutras, and they're they're just so magical. There's something magic in them. They're the radiant sutras. They're incredible. They're the most beautiful sure. things I've ever read, and they put Wait, I'm me. I'm gonna buy this. Oh, it is. They are. Chloe, you're going to love them. They're just, it's all about connecting. It's a basically a conversation between like the, the cosmos and it is, I can't, I won't even do it. I'm literally ordering it right now, by the way, I, uh, something crazy. That's not crazy, but something novel that happened during COVID is I started reading about Buddhism. I started like Mm -hmm. reading my first, uh, books about Buddhism. So I'm reading this book about tantric Buddhism at the moment. And now I'm going to order this. I feel like it's like very similar in the same it's vein. It's just so gorgeous, but it talks about, you know, concentration and devotion and being able to be expansive and also focused. And Sam Harris talks a lot about this in his meditation app as well and waking mm-hmm. up just the power of focusing on something and how that can create this expansiveness. And I just, I want more conversations like this, you know, this yeah. is because it's aspirational to me and it's available to every single person. It's a, it's available to all of us, whether it's God or the creator or the life force or whatever that sense is everybody. I seem to come in contact with who has any sort of peace or stability or centered in their selfness is grounded in these very ancient principles of, And stoicism seems to be coming up a lot, which I think I need to uh, <laughs> explore. I keep have you, hearing every. Have you gotten to the part on uh, stoicism in, theory of en- in the theory of enchantment course? No. Oof. So I teach stoicism through the text of Marcus Aurelius, Ooh, but I, I but I, but I, my favorite. <laughs> My most exciting part about the stoicism piece is that I teach it using the Lion King. Because the Lion King is like, for, like my whole theory about the Lion King is like, there's a reason why we're obsessed with this movie as a culture. <laughs> <laughs> it has everything that we've always gravitated towards as a culture. It has, it has Christian ideas. It has Buddhist ideas. It has Stoic ideas. It ha- it's so, it's such, it's so rich as a, as a literary text, the Lion King. Uh, but yeah, you should uh, check that out. When you I read that. your recent newsletter that was talking about the Lion King. Oh yeah, so that's like a snippet of like a uh, of what is 
a deeper dive into like the character development of Simba and how he has to learn certain stoic principles actually to become mm. mature emotionally and to actually become king. So, yeah. Yeah, I've heard from a lot of people that stoicism is helping them a, a, a lot in this time. Mhm. So, I can see you you seem to have a, a like little bit of everything in the course that everybody everybody's gravitating to and it is it's you know when I talk to you I'm optimistic and so I find that one of the things that I've been really trying to focus on is what am I ingesting Mm -hmm. I've been off Twitter pretty much all week and I feel (laughs) really good you know and I feel pretty much because I've been joking about this for years it's such a weird thing where you'll be plugged in online and everyone's fighting and it feels like a war and then you <laughs> unplug and you walk outside and in my backyard, there are like hummingbirds and an yeah. orange tree and it's like a Disney movie. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and I need to spend more time in the outside Disney movie. Yeah. And, you know, we've had, I was, when I was, had Aisha on, she was talking about how essentially this, you know, I was like the mental health for people has been, it's not good. Yeah. And we were talking about how it's essentially like a Black Mirror episode. I'm like, you take an entire population, lock them up, and then all they have is the internet, which is basically where everyone just is projecting their cognitive distortions all day long. Like, yeah. it just I, I've seen people descend into madness in the past three months. And they yeah. will believe anything because they're so desperate for... Well, yeah, they're, they're, they're desperate for knowledge. They're also... They're, uh, they also don't understand the distinction between information and wisdom. So that so we're now in a in an era of humanity where we have unlimited access to information, which is not the same as discerning wisdom out of the information. And also, people are, are what else are they hungry? For? They're hungry for something. Oh, they're hungry for control, right? Because their life is just it feels like their life is going up in chaos. So what they need is a they need a narrative that will give them control and unfortunately there are a lot of uh charlatans out here promising (laughs) promising uh, people that they have the right narrative when really their narrative is internally inconsistent at best and corrupt at worst so look i think like this is a golden opportunity for us as people who want to serve and 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 have really really good things to teach the world to step up to the plate and to to be available to folks because the people are really struggling right now. People are, for some people, they're, they're enduring hardship. This is the first time they've encountered hardship and suffering in their life. And you know, like how, how crazy, crazily discombobulating that can be, you know? Yeah. So, and I do think that it's, I've always just wanted to empower the individual to be themselves. Yeah. You know, to, to have the faith in themselves to be, able to move into the world and I don't know just have that I guess the only way I developed it though is by like getting the crap kicked out of me by life but having to be centered in myself having that core of knowing like it will be okay and whatever happens will be I don't necessarily think everything happens for a reason I kind of stop at everything happens and I don't even need to come up with reasons. I just need to come into acceptance about what is happening. Yeah. And that's not easy. <laughs> that's <laughs> like, yeah. It's like one of the hardest things to do to like, to be sort of content with the fact that we've been for whatever reason placed into a moment in history where things are breaking down and reform. and reform. <laughs> Yeah, part of me also loves it. I'm like, you guys, this is the opportunity to, for us to really have an evolution of human consciousness and like transcend our our tribal base petty like instincts. What a what a grand opportunity! And then I go on Twitter and I'm like, no, this is the wrong, this is the wrong <laughs> response. And no, you're like, missing Fuck the point. You. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, You're like missing the point of the of the of the <laughs> opportunity of the suffering that the suffering You're is literally. <laughs> for some reason, when you told me this, I just had this image of Eddie Murphy and ca- coming to America when he's singing oh. out the window, and everyone <laughs> yeah. in New York is like, "Fuck you!" <laughs> that's you on Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> You're that's like, true. you guys, it's beautiful, and they're like, "Shut up." That's true. That's, true. that's a good. That's a good point. <laughs> 
no, it's amazing. We need you. You are so positive and optimistic and more when you, when we lose you, that's when I'll really start to worry. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I hopefully will try to stop myself from descending into the dark side. Please call <laughs> me before you do. Before I do, I'll be like, Bridget, listen, listen. <laughs> I've called you in my dark moments, so. True, yeah. I'm happy to have you as a sounding board. Definitely. I'm happy to have you in my life. Before we wrap up, I'm still going to ask you the same two questions because as we know, humans evolve. What <laughs> is your biggest defect of character or vice that you're working on right now? Oh, that's such a great... I forgot you asked me that question last time. I I think I'm working on like... I'm learning like detachment. Mm. I don't think attachment is necessarily a vice, but it can be. Yeah. And so I'm learning detachment and, and, and I'm trying to teach myself that I focus on that in meditation and like depersonalization, depersonalizing things, which I've spoken to you about yep. in the past. Um, Good advice. It, yeah. I needed to hear it. So it, you know, it's a, uh, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to practice, but that's, a, that's one of the things I'm definitely working on. And it, it goes back to your earlier point about like, you know, presence and peace of mind. So. And what is your biggest asset? Um, I think my biggest asset is the ability to see that, like, the things really are puzzles to be put together, and they're not, like, one-dimensional. Mm. Like, nothing is one-dimensional. Mm-hmm. My, my ability to see that is, has proven very uh, beneficial lately. Good. And- <laughs> yeah. It is you, you are just an amazing spirit. And the thing that Nikki Mark, the woman who lost her son and came on said, she said, never underestimate the impact one soul can have. And Mm -hmm. I just love that. And I think you're one of those souls that has a much larger ripple effect than you might even be aware of. So just keep, Keep being that beacon of hope and and calm and kind of reason and sanity and um and dancing. Yes, I'll, I, that's my thank you for saying that. That's my advice to like the world is ending when people no longer dance with each other. That's what that's what I think. Yeah, I agree. Honestly. So as long as we can keep dancing with each other, there's hope. And where can we find you in Theory of Enchantment? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at C Valdery. You can find Theory of Enchantment also on Twitter and Instagram at Theory of Enchantment and Enchant Theory. And you can check out the website, theoryofenchantment.com, to find out more about what's in the course. We got free resources for teachers as well. So if you're a teacher looking for social emotional learning courses, uh, that's pretty cool. It uses Disney and also other forms of pop culture. Check out theoryofenchantment.com. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bridget. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Okay, yeah, so tell me about the letter. So, because I saw it on your Twitter, there's this whole hoopla about a letter, and then people were taking their names off it, but I was like, I don't even want to bother investigating this. (laughs) It's inside baseball, so it'd be kind of hard to investigate anyways, because it's such media drama in some respects, and all these people put their name on a letter at Harper's, which is like a old, you know, very well established magazine, and they wrote a letter saying, you know, we need to push back against the the far right and Donald Trump. What everybody has to say before they then said, we also see illiberalism and tendencies of silencing elsewhere. They didn't specifically say the left because whatever they're pussies, yeah, and. And so they, and it was all these people that we've interviewed. Chloe was on it. Thomas Chatterton Williams, who we have coming on. Um, We have, I'll be talking to Kamel about actually tomorrow. So we'll actually get to talk about this. And many, many people, Barry Weiss was on it. Katie Herzog, who's been in the trenches taking the hits. And, but notably, there weren't a lot of other people on it. Like Brett Weinstein, Heather Hying, none of the grievance studies people who were were on it. Most of the people on this letter, J.K. Rowling was on it. That's why. So then there was this big outcry because everybody said it was basically a dog whistle to transphobia, and that what the what this letter was really saying was that it, it was like an anti-trans group, just not openly anti-trans. <sighs> 
yeah, because the, J.K. Rowling was on it. Because J- yeah, J- because J.K. Rowling was on it, and because she is allegedly a bigot, and so then there was backlash, and then there was the people. You know, Ruben, Eric Weinstein was definitely, I was kind of like, oh, nice of you guys to join us here and (laughs) glad you, I was a little bit snarky about it. My first reaction was not my best because I'm like, you all have media jobs and you're all elite and most all of them, not all of them, but most of them are protected by their institutions and elitism like Matt Iglesias who's at Vox surprisingly put his name on and his whole staff has turned on him and now it's like a big you know only kind of proving what the letter was was saying. saying yeah and the the argument is that these are people with power who don't want to be held accountable for what they say and or these are people with power saying bigoted things and they shouldn't be allowed to say them they should they should face consequences for saying them so based on someone's interpretation that this is a transphobic whistle that then they're accused of bigotry and even though the letter probably had nothing to do with those things no it was just about being able to have discussions it's everything that we've been saying on this freaking podcast for for literally over a year so (laughs) for people even i mean even ruben i can i can understand why people like Ruben, who kind of got pushed out of the left, and Eric Weinstein, who he was saying, even on Twitter today, he was like, am I mad about this? Yes, I am mad, because he was more mad about his brother and Heather, who got kicked out of Evergreen by a freaking mob of leftists that they weren't on the, that they had, weren't asked to sign it. And so there are people who were canceled and have lost things and have been taking hits socially, fiscally, and just in status and opportunity and that have, I think, been sounding this alarm for much longer and they weren't on it. It's like, it's basically, I mean, Barry's been getting knocked around for a long time. So Mm. she, she's, she's taken a lot of hits from the left. They're so cruel to her. It's insane. But so many of the other people, it's like they just woke up and were like, oh, we have a problem. And some people were saying on the right, it's more pre- self-preservation. They're like gathering together because they see that the, they're next in line. Yeah. And what they don't understand is that it's not going to matter. They're still going to come for them and burn their house down. They don't care. Right. Because they're you're not allowed to question them. You're not allowed to say things that they see yeah, as they, problematic. Like. The point, there's people who want to talk and be like, we should have discussions. This stuff shouldn't be taboo. And then there are people who are like, no, you're phobic, you're bigoted, you're racist, because you want to have those conversations. That's ridiculous. Yeah, if you even ask the question, you're a transphobe or you're a bigot or racist. Right. So people are pushing back and that's good. I think it's good. I don't think it matters because as... I've discovered it doesn't matter if I think I'm on the left. They've already decided that I'm not. Mm -hmm. And these folks who all signed this letter, I jokingly on Twitter today was like, welcome to the alt-right because they don't really realize it doesn't matter what they think or believe. They're now going to be basically labeled as transphobes, bigots, and members of the Mm alt-right. And you there's no... Because they're ideologues. So you can't have a conversation with somebody. They have no intention of having a conversation. No. It's get in line or get out. And luckily there are, I mean, JK, uh, it's good that big people with big media platforms are speaking up, but ultimately I I don't think it's going to matter. So did people take their names off the letter? Yeah, two, when they started- two women took their names off the letter. That's even worse. It's like, they said on. I was unaware of who else was signing the letter. So it's it's only again proving the point of the letter, which is this cancel culture, guilt by association, all this stuff is bad. Right. And they kind of immediately I mean at, the letter was immediately proven true like instantly. Right. But it's also so it's in some ways reflective of something much larger that we know has been going on for a long time and there's been multiple canaries that have died in that coal mine. Yeah. And in other ways, you know, I read these emails about self-censorship and stuff like that, and it's bad and dangerous, and it puts me in a dark place. 
and what we're seeing is n- bad. But on the other hand, it's like petty media infighting and it feels very elitist and stupid too. Mm -hmm. So there's, I feel two ways about it. Yeah. It's like, it's important that they do it, but then it creates this whole kerfuffle amongst these, this group of people where you're like, you're not really the ones affected by this. (laughs) Yeah. And then there's just the selfish, selfish ego driven part of me that's like, where are my accolades? (laughs) And like, hello, I've been saying this for two years. I've been saying it for longer than two years. I've been saying it for five years. Uh-huh. Like, it cost me my job at Playboy. Uh-huh. So why don't you fucking talk to people who actually have lost something? And that's kind of what Eric's point was. He's like, why don't you talk to the people who have, you know, suffered from this right. instead of just a bunch of media people who are like, we agree that we are forming a mob to protect ourselves from the mob. We know it's coming because we don't agree with everything they have to say, and it's bad. <sighs> but it's also exactly, it's stupid. It's it's exhausting just talking about it for 10 minutes. It's I don't know a, how you freaking... It's not even exhausting, <laughs> though, because that's another thing that I always hate on yeah, like, I social that. media. I saw your, your thing. But just, it's like, it's draining in a way. It's like soul-sucking. Yeah, it's, it's there's a soul sucking aspect to it where I'm just like this. Uh, I don't know how you survive in that stew of whatever the fuck it is. <laughs> the Twitter wars. Yeah. Somebody said to it was funny. They, they I think I'm going to write a piece about it. They said Charlie Wurzel. He writes for the Times, I believe, for t- about tech. And he <laughs> had screenshot a sentence. I don't even know whose it was, but. They said, as somebody who's a survivor of the Twitter wars, and he was like, some of you need to log out. Right. And then, I mean, we all joke about the Twitter wars. I don't think anyone ever says it unironically other than maybe that person who said it. I think that it's just like gives you a very cynical aspect of the of cynical, like I'm hearing about it and I'm like, Jesus, sprained my fucking eyes, yeah. you know? And to to live in that cycle and just be there all the time You've got to be it, it. I feel like it just would embitter you and and make you just like despondent about the human experience in a lot of it ways. It does. Some <laughs> of it's ego, though. You know, some of these people, it, it, like as much as they're like, we can't believe the outrage. They love the outrage, mm-hmm. and it raises all of their profiles. And so, not many. I don't know how self-aware everybody is. Right. You know, I I definitely, we talked about this like with, I'm aware that I could kick a lot of fucking hornet's nests and then get piled on and then it would raise my profile. Mm -hmm. I'm aware that I could publicly drag people who have done fucked up things in my DMs, who have done inappropriate things from the left and right, who have done things that are, unethical and i could easily raise my profile that way right by calling them out by calling them out publicly and showing receipts or whatever the fuck the kids these days call it Uh and it's not what i want to do yeah and maybe that's stupid like maybe that's me being bad at capitaliseming that's that's having a certain element of class to you (laughs) i just don't want to have to get addicted it's like what i see happening with most people in media is they start getting high on their own supply right and it's like all of these people are i'm like you guys are i'm guilty of the same things i get i'm just as much of a junkie i've just figured out how to turn that into a show where i can express all of that angst and outrage but i still have the algorithms working on my brain and I'm just lucky I have a program that I can apply to to social media like an actual a program of addiction that I can apply right and you always said like Donald Trump gives us the the excuse to be the lowest form of ourselves yeah like the he, worst the worst form of, of yourself and that's what I think that would that's where I think that would take you is if you started to do that kind of thing. It's just like lowering and lowering and lowering your your own expectations of yourself and your own like standards by which you live and that kind of thing. I just don't want to have to, I don't want to have to get 
ever take myself that seriously. Yeah. And I think that was something that I realized when I w- got over my initial, like, where are my accolades moment is that I'm not an elitist. Uh-huh. I'm a fucking idiot who stumbled into the culture wars and was a waitress and didn't really know anything about our government, didn't know anything about our politics, and I've been in a steep learning curve ever since. Right. And essentially stumbled out of a blackout. Like, I might as well been somebody who woke up out of a coma in 2015 and was like, hey, what about a real man? You know, like using these turns of phrase that weren't allowed anymore. Hell, I'm still in a coma, apparently. But um, yeah, no, I think that you're kind of, you're you're one of the people. You're a man of the people down I there in the trenches. I am a woman of the, I'm a freaking <laughs> dirtbag in the mention. You're a populist hero. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Maybe, That's where I see this going. <laughs> maybe I'll be the dick. Wouldn't it be the ultimate fantasy if I end up being the dictator? I don't think anyone sets out to be a dictator. I think it just happens. I think and Hitler then, might have set out to be well, a dictator. Well, Hitler pr- was a little bit more organized. <laughs> I think that man had a plan. <laughs> he he set out. He set out. But I don't know that all of them do. P- maybe not all of them. What was it? recently oh no it was something it was like an, in a youtube video i was watching it was like um that old saying yeah how uh power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, corrupts absolutely. absolutely she was like it's not necessarily that she's like i don't think that that's true or someone did a study on this and they were like power reveals power reveals what that person's intentions or truth right. always was and it just gives them more and more of an opportunity to act on it and show what it is yeah and really, I see all of the media wars. It's just about power. You know, I think my own resentment was me seeing all these media elites recognizing that there's money on the table because they're losing it to the their like liberal bases fleeing mm-hmm. and running to the center. And it's just, it's funny because in the in the post that they wrote in the letter, I'm like, yeah, I've this piece has been written multiple times by multiple people. Mm-hmm. Oh, for years now. Mm-hmm. And it's just all of a sudden, because it had all of these names, it carried right. this weight. And you're like, fuck off. <laughs> so there was a, definitely like a scorned part of me that felt like. Yeah. Less- and there's that part of you that's like, well, why I'm recognizing I'm not an elite. Right. I'm fucking the female Donald Trump. I really am. Like, I understand his psyche. I get it. He was that guy from Queens. He could never be like one of the Manhattan elite, the old money. They spurned him. They always made fun of his cheesiness and like being such a kind of dork. And and so Bridget will rise as the new female Donald Trump. <laughs> awesome. This is where w- what we have to look forward to. I can't wait to be shitting on a gold toilet while tweeting. We'd like to thank our sponsor this week, Skillshare. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash walkin, where our listeners get two free months of premium membership. That's two months free at Skillshare.com slash walkin. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs) 